Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Today we are talking how we built Config as Code. So let's start with a little bit of housekeeping today. There'll be no requirements to record today's session. Uh, we will be emailing you uh, generally the Monday afterwards with a link to the recording uh, and all the resources in today's webinar. There will be time for questions at the end of today's session. Um, what we prefer is if you use Zoom Q&A for the questions, uh, please don't use Zoom chat. Uh, often the questions can get lost uh, and our preference is to use Zoom Q&A. If you're on YouTube, um, we will monitor the YouTube channel. Um, what you can also do is you can also join our community Slack on octopus.com forward slash Slack. And if you put your questions into the webinar channel. Okay, so today I'm joined by Mr. Michael Richardson, and here he is. Hey, Michael, how are you today? Hello, Derek. I'm very well, thank you. It's nice to be uh, joining you via the magic of the internet. You in Scotland and me here in Brisbane. And unfortunately, as always, as what always happens, you have drawn the short end of the stick. But when you're holding a stick like I am, um, obviously, uh, you always get the, <laughs> the good bitty. Um so tell us a little bit about your, your role at um, Octopus, Michael. So I'm a product manager. My role is director of product. And to give the short version, I guess I spend my days uh, listening to customers' problems and hopefully figuring out solutions to them. And in today's session, we're going to be talking about one of those solutions. And we're going to be talking about Config as Code, Michael. Indeed. I'm pretty excited to talk about this. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think there's, there's, this is a game changer, I think. Uh, it's a really key feature. And so what we're going to be talking about today with Michael is why Config is Code. You know, what we want to do is understand why Octopus has chosen to do it now. Um, how did we deliver uh, Config is Code? And then from there, we're going to share some of the lessons learned along the way for all the engineers out there. Uh, we'll, we'll provide some information on how you can provide feedback uh, and one just last thing is we'll, we'll provide um, or we'll try to provide what our roadmap looks like for Config as Code uh, going future. And then, like I said earlier on, um, at that point, we are then going to jump into Q&A. Uh, we should have 10 to 15 minutes um, and I'll put those questions to Michael and, and we can all make him squirm in his seat. So we're going to go uh, behind the curtain a little bit. Yes. Uh, and. I love these webinars. I think they add a lot of value because, you know, I think we work out, you know, fairly out in the open, Michael. Um, yeah. It is nice to kind of show people you're working, I think, sometimes. Okay, so um, discussion time. Uh, so let's jump in. Um, so at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to jump in and I'm going to ask um, Michael some questions. So let's uh, jump in then. So, Michael, let's jump in with the, the, the most obvious question. What is Config as Code? Feels like a good place to start, right? Yes. So, I, I think when we're talking about Config as Code and the way it's typically used in, in similar tools as well, we're talking about taking configuration that was stored in a database and so was only accessible via the web UI or HTTP and representing that as a text file which can be stored in version control uh, alongside application code. And I, you know, I think this is to, even broader than that. This, this is about taking the, the tools and processes that it, developers are, are familiar with working with and wanting to apply that as much as possible across everything. And everywhere I said version control just then, you can pretty much substitute that with Git because let's face it, uh, the version control Wars were fought and won at this point. So, yeah. And there's me thinking we're going to bring back SoulSafe. Um, so, not really, not with this one. No, I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there uh, eventually. So, obviously, uh, that's the thing. I think, um, so what's that concept um, with Octopus? You know, th there was something around um, you could actually store your deployment process as code beforehand. However, that wasn't fully featured. You know, obviously, what you could do before was actually have scripts source controlled in GitHub and then, you know, put them into your deployment process as code. So, that was the closest thing that we've ever had um, with Config as code. 
Yeah, there have been a few approaches that have uh, flown around over the years. Another one was our Terraform provider. That's another I, what I would class as way of representing configuration uh, as as code. The the downside or the drawback of all of those existing approaches was that you were always working on conceptually a single instance of the deployment process in Octopus because Octopus itself had no knowledge of of branches. Even if you ran that those Terraform files or or the scripts, you were always modifying the the single version of the deployment process, and this this was a real drawback. So I mean we'll talk about it a little bit more later on, but the key difference with this approach is I guess it's it's native config as code. So Octopus is now branch aware. It understands that that there can be multiple versions of your deployment process living on different branches in Git. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so the question, the next logical question is, what made us build it and why did we build it now, Michael? Uh, the short answer to why did we build it is because people asked for it and that sounds um, pretty simplistic. But, you know, over the years, we, we kind of saw it go from being a, a this would be nice type of feature request and just gradually build in volume to a, I guess a crescendo of no, this is really, really important to us. We must have this. Um, and so, you know, the to, I guess go, um, you know, to break the product management fourth wall a little bit. Often when we're deciding which features to build it, we kind of talk about things like does this appeal to existing users or does it potentially attract new ones. With this, it was everyone asking for it. So all existing Octopus users, it was a really highly requested. Um, feature it easily became our our most requested item, um, and it was the same thing when when you know demoing Octopus to potential new users as well. It was always high on the list of of questions. Can we we version control the the configuration for this? Um, and I guess the the other thing that we consider, I guess, when deciding what to build is, is would we use it? And the answer for us was absolutely yes as well. I mean, we're a development team too, and we we like to apply those development processes, you know, basically to version control, whatever we can as well. So yeah, it was time. Awesome. Awesome. So obviously, um, tell us a little bit about the journey. Um, so obviously we decided it was time. Um, so mm. we're obviously we're about to release it in early access. Um, give us that journey. Journey is the right word here. Maybe Odyssey is better. Uh, so this journey probably started back in early 2020, I guess, was the moment that we decided to to turn the first earth or, or write the first code. And we knew with this feature, we, we knew it wasn't going to be easy to build. There were a lot of unknowns for us, both in how we would engineer this, also how we wanted it to work. There were many different approaches we could have taken to building this. Essentially, we wanted to start by removing some unknowns. And we felt like the best way to do that initially was to build a proof of concept. So we took a few of the opinions that we had about the feature and we built them. In six weeks, we built an initial cut. It was rough and ready um, and it was designed to be throw away from the start. So that was really successful. And to be honest, in, in my time at Octopus, this is the probably the only time I can remember us building a, a throwaway proof of concept on a feature of, of this kind of scale. Um, that let us validate some engineering assumptions that we could build it. It let us validate some of the uh, opinions that we had about how the feature should work. We went, yeah, this actually works the way we hope. And so then we started to build it for real. And we did that. We worked on it for maybe nearly a year, maybe not quite, but it was for quite a while. Essentially, we got towards the end of that and our engineering team pretty much said, look, we've learned a lot along the way of this journey and we want to change some of these things before we even ship it for the first time. Basically, we want a V2 uh, right, right out of the gate. Um, and the reason for that was we, we didn't feel like we could support what we had uh, in production. I'll talk a little bit about a few of the specifics there. So in terms of the way we interacted with Git, we originally wrapped around the Git command line because that was, we kind of felt the most pragmatic choice initially. Um, that, as you can probably imagine, came with a lot of drawbacks, not just for performance reasons, but also for, for actually shipping it and 
just the interop between the command line and the code base. We threw that away and, and went with a, a libgit based solution. So the libgit sharp library wraps that. But also, you know, you know the old uh, cliche about everyone engineers their application to replace their database layer, but no one ever does. Well, we with this feature, we pretty much have, except we haven't replaced the existing database layer. We've got another one beside it now. And it's even harder than that because it's not like swapping out a relational database for another relational database. It's it's swapping out a relational database for a persistence uh, mechanism with a whole bunch of different assumptions. Like there's no foreign keys. There's no single version of things because you can have multiple branches. So hopefully, uh, you know, you can start to put yourself in, in the mind of what that code might look like. And I guess we wanted to take the learnings over those months of development and redo some of the abstractions around that to um, take advantage of the things that we've learned. So, you know, we've got these concept of document stores now that, that can be either database or Git um, aware. And yeah, basically just uh, re-engineer it with the, the learning. So you could think of the version that we've currently built of this that, that we're rolling out right now as really the V3 of the application at this point. Um, and so the journey, the stage of the journey we're at now is uh, the, the actual feature is now shipped. It's live in all of our Octopus Cloud instances. It's currently turned off, hidden behind a feature flag. We've got it enabled in, in our internal instances. So I guess we're in the, the dog fooding uh, phase of, of the development. And yeah, we've learned, we've learned a lot along the way um, from, from building that. Turns, turns out that you know, when, you, when you lose things like foreign keys in a database, uh, it really changes the way that you have to, to have to build things. It changes some of the core assumptions of, of the application. And it's been a journey. <laughs> It's funny you should say that. Obviously, I've had access to it. Uh, I was playing with it last November, uh, and I remember at the time I, I was actually using uh, HCL uh, as part of that. Um, obviously, that's now changed. Um, so with that, um, one of the things, and obviously not everyone's going to be aware of that, um, what design decisions were taken along the way? And, and can you share, uh, like, for instance, the language selection? Uh, what does that look like, and how did we get there? Yeah, so before we get to the language uh, choice, because that one is fun to talk about, a few of the other, I guess, key op design opinions that we really um, that we really wanted to stick to was one um, that was important to us was that we didn't want to force a choice on users to choose between the Octopus UI or a source controlled implementation. You know, over the years when people would ask us for this feature, we kind of had a common list of questions that we would ask in response. And one of them was always, would you be willing to give up the Octopus UI in order to have a, a source representation? And the answer was kind of always, oh, do we do we have to choose? Um, and, you know, we we played with a, a lot of other tools in in designing this feature. And it always just felt like such a terrible choice to have to make as a user, uh, especially if you had to make it not at a user level, but at a project level, which is often the way it works. So we, we wanted to offer both the Octopus UI and the source code representation of it, not one or the other. That was a pretty key um, design opinion that we wanted to stick to. Would have made it a lot easier to build if we didn't, but uh, that's a common theme here. The, another design opinion that we had was we wanted, if we were going to do this, we wanted to expose the power of Git. So you know there were many different ways we could have built it, and many of them w would have been easier, but Git and branches are almost synonymous at this point. And we, one of the first things you'll notice when you use the feature in the application is there's there's a giant branch which are on your deployment process now. So you can actually change to a different branch in the Octopus UI and work on that branch. And just and then when you go to create a release, you can choose the branch that you create the release from. And just exposing that that power of Git in the UI, again, it wasn't something that we wanted to do a light version of, if you like. Um, the th and third one I'll talk about quickly is, is this idea of, I guess, feature parity. And again, this is about not, we really didn't want to force users to make bad choices. And 
we didn't want you to have to choose between either having a version controlled project but losing most of the Octopus features or having all the features but not having a version controlled project. It just feels like such a, again, terrible choice as a user. And again, it would have made it much easier to build if we hadn't just stripped all the features away and started from scratch. But then we would have, we really didn't want to be in an arms race with ourselves either of trying to build those features into the version control projects while new ones were being added. So basically all, wherever possible, all uh, the features work in version controlled projects. So really the idea of not having to make compromises to use version control was, was really important to us. Um, but should we talk a little bit about the language choice? <clears throat> well, it's, it's, you know, it's one of my favorite topics. Yeah, so again, those questions when we were asked as a feature request for this, one of the questions on the list was always, so which, you know, which configuration language should we use? And the takeaway, I guess, of that, the summary of that information is everyone hates all of them. And we had to accept pretty early on that whichever one we chose, we were going to disappoint some people. And that was fine. We can we can live with that. So you know, the the obvious choices, let, let's run through them a little bit. So, I mean, the easiest choice from an implementation point of view for us would have been to use JSON as the configuration language because we already persist a lot of things to JSON inside the, uh, inside the SQL database. However, you know, JSON's a great language for representing serialized objects. Brilliant. It's not really designed for representing documents because our, our key thing here was readability. We... These, these files get read far more often than they get written. Um, and JSON, in our opinion, sacrificed some, some readability there. Um, so we sort of moved on from it as a choice. And the next really obvious consideration would have been uh, YAML. And honestly, it wouldn't have been wrong to use it. As far as readability goes, it's really nice. Uh, it definitely can be tricky to edit. Like some of the, <laughs> you are nodding in sympathy here, Derek. Yes, I am. It's 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 so powerful, but using it, it just it could be better. Yeah, and you know, it's it's excellent. I think for trivial documents as well. For the for many deployment process, they're not trivial documents. They can be really quite huge, and you know, figuring out what level of nesting you're at in them is is kind of yuck and. Also, we were pretty aware that these documents will be both human edited and machine edited. And again, YAML brought in some complications with that. So we kind of cast our eye a little further. Let's throw XML into the mix because uh, part of me would have loved to have made the kind of contrarian play and uh, gone with XML. Would have been fun for our marketing team, I think. But um, you know, again, for that readability, it's pretty verbose. So we we looked at a language based on HashiCorp's HCL configuration language. Many of the Octopus team were already familiar with it via Terraform. And it has a lot of nice properties. It's designed for this sort of task. It's what it's built for. We think it's pretty human readable and we think it's pretty nice to, to edit as well. And at the end of the day, it pretty much came down to uh, us polling our own development team and saying, you know, which of these languages would you want to work with? And, yeah, it was it was a pretty close uh, close run thing between uh, a HCL based language or or YAML, but yeah, we went with what we're calling uh, OCL Octopus configuration language. Awesome, awesome! It's really good because that's the thing. I think for me, I can understand YAML. Um, the thing I, I love, you know, obviously, I've mentioned my opinion on YAML uh, quite a few times, and it is. It's I love how powerful and reusable it is, and how I can port it around and generally reuse it. Um, obviously, I'm reusing the fact I said reusability. However, yeah. I think <laughs> I love it, but. At the same time, is I absolutely hate using it. Um, you know, obviously, but the end result is undeniably very powerful um, and readable. So that's it, right? Because that's the thing is, I obviously I'm not from a development background, so I spend way more time reading code than I do writing it. Um, and when I do write it, it's probably not that readable. Um, however. It does do that. So can you share any um, information on Octopus configuration language and how it all works? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Actually, Derek, you made a really interesting point there, though. Like you, you declared yourself not a developer and therefore, you know, um, don't like writing it a whole lot. I, I would argue that that's true of everyone. I, I don't think many people sit down from scratch and write these configuration 
documents, no matter what the language is, whether it's a cloud formation template or a Terraform file or. I, I yeah. pretty much always start from something else. Um, you know, it's the first thing I do. I normally Google something and someone has started something and I'll maybe remove like 60% of it and then kind of move on from there. Yeah, which again is why it was so important for us to keep the UI as well, because, you know, that having version control configuration is really powerful. Staring at an empty text document, it just isn't. And another key takeaway we had with all of this was that to a large extent, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference, the configuration language used. I suspect a lot of people may disagree with that statement, but most of the benefits come regardless of the assuming it's not a terrible format it's uh yeah as long as yeah. it's readable and it's version controlled i think that's um, the thing i think it's key that it's readable and easy to write and and because that's the thing is is like that I, you know for instance obviously like you said i'm not part i'm not um a developer so that doesn't mean obviously i'm not comfortable going in and making minor edits so like that sometimes like that i would jump into that but for the most part i would see myself continuing using the ui over that command line but at the same time as is, is if you're if you're constantly spinning up new projects i could see there's a lot of really great use cases there yeah absolutely uh but i didn't answer your question before ocl so yeah ocl is definitely takes a lot of inspiration from hashicorp's hcl the reason we we called it ocl is you know we've got our own custom implementation our own serializer and parser and there's nothing tying it to to HashiCorp's implementation. Um, in fact, you know, HCL's already on a, a V2 that's got some new constructs in it, like uh, I think if statements and iterators, but that we don't think at this stage make a lot of sense in deployment processes. So uh, I, I guess to some extent the, the two are forked and there's nothing stopping us from diverging further in the future. I was interested to see somewhat recently um, Azure's new configuration language, Bicep, I believe they've called it, is is a very HCL-looking language as well. And yeah, it was a nice validation. I think, um, to be honest, I think, see, like, obviously I'm a, a Azure uh, social architect and all that sort of good stuff. The thing is, is like, ARM, no one is having a good time with ARM. So the, the thing is, is, is infrastructure and just generally anything needs to be a little bit easier. And Bicep is so much easier to, uh, to write than something like arm which is is json based um so no one's really having a good I, to be honest i love i love azure json makes me i'd say pull my hair out but um so yeah uh, it's a uh, it is but that's the thing though um and i'm really interested because when using ocl i found it quite easy to write um which is really good so another question just to put you in the uh, in the hot seat Obviously, there are other um, tools out there that do similar things to Octopus. How does our implementation with, of, with, of Config as Code, how does that compare? And, do, you know, do you feel that we have got an advantage over other uh, tools? Um, what, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, so let's let's be honest here. We're not exactly early to the game with implementing a Config as Code feature. Most... Uh, Many tools in the in the ecosystem have have some way of version controlling their their configuration, which gives us a really great chance to to play with those first and and see what makes for a great user experience and what doesn't. And we've done that over the years, and specifically when when building this feature. And I guess what we found was that tools kind of sat on a spectrum with the approaches that they took at, at one end of the spectrum you've got i guess the the idea that you kind of use git almost as as a sync mechanism so you make changes in the application they get pushed sometimes even only one way so it doesn't read back from git it just pushes them into git and and that's it, it i guess you can think of it as using it as an, an audit log almost we'll call that like the git light kind of end of the spectrum um and you know, going through that, then you might have implementations that read and write from the Git uh, source, but still they don't expose any concepts of branches or anything in the application. If we move right down to the other end of the spectrum, uh, where I guess it's kind of all in on on the config as code, this is this idea that, you know, who even needs a UI? You're just, uh, you're in config as code now, land now, so it's very Git native because it's, it's just a text file. Um, and so 
I think the we we kind of went for the Goldilocks, uh, not too hot, not too cold here. We really wanted the full power of Git. We really didn't want to give up all the goodness of the Octopus UI, and the we thought that would bring the best user experience. It definitely made it the the trickiest to build. And having gone through this journey, can ha absolutely see why different tools take all these different varying approaches to it. Um, I guess I'll contrast with one specifically, one tool that you know we're fans of at Octopus and have used quite a bit is Azure DevOps. Um, so the approach that they took with their YAML pipelines was they effectively, they were a new type of pipeline and they went very much at the all in end of the spectrum. You know, you were editing YAML files, you could definitely switch branches on them and they stripped away a lot of the the functionality from the release pipeline certainly initially to to build those so they they went right back to i guess basics and and put it in source control uh totally uh <laughs> they don't need my approval but totally valid approach um we also had the luxury of seeing where that ended up and it, it did end up with having you know the two different project types to choose from um they to this day still quite haven't been reconciled. Um, they've you're very much editing YAML in the UI with with the implementation. Um, yeah, so I, I guess our our approach we we try to expose the power of Git wherever possible. You can switch branches in the UI. We if you want to edit Git full if full ability to do so. If you want to crack open VS Code and make changes in it that way, Octopus will scoop them up and read from them just like it. It would um, if you'd made them through the UI, but if you want to keep using the Octopus UI, you can also use it exactly as you would today as well, with the additional ability to switch branches and edit on um, different branches. So hopefully that gives some sense of where on the the spectrum we fell with uh, our implementation. That's it. I think as well, I really like it um, mostly just because I can test something really quickly because. I don't know about you, Michael, but I, you know, when when I was an Octopus user uh, before I joined Octopus, you know, someone would ask me to make a change to a project. I'd go in, I would probably disable seven steps, I'd clone them, make the smallest change, and then I'd go in, and then I would, you know, obviously I have to flick between them and then create a new release, then do that. You know, th th there was a lot of pain um, there, whereas now you can do that in a branch, right? Yeah, like ignoring everything we've just spoken about with version control, this little mechanism of being able to, as you said, no longer have to make changes on the live version of the deployment process, being able to now switch to a new branch, make your changes, safely test them in a development or test environment without impacting that mainline branch. If you didn't have to go home for the day, you don't have to worry about getting it back into a working state, you can leave it broken. Like from my personal um, experience, having used it so far, like if you took all the rest of the version control away, I want this mechanism to stay regardless. It is legitimately a really significant change to the way that you can work in Octopus. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing is, is you, you know, say like I always, you know, re-enable the wrong step as well. So it just kind of avoids all that um, uh, back and forth and and, you know, causing issues because uh, more often than not if there's a problem in octopus it's normally me um so yeah it's quite funny so we see we went through some of the the design decisions some of the you know how we landed up on octopus uh, configuration language so give us what are give us your value proposition uh what are the key benefits of config as code and i think we've touched on most of them so far if i'm being honest yeah i think so but let's let's recap a little so i mean <laughs> To, to jump right up to the top level, I think what, what this allows you to do is it allows you to evolve your Octopus configuration alongside your application code. We Over the years, engineering teams have, have adopted uh, both tools and practices of working that revolve around version control. You know, we're talking pull requests, um, yeah, all those uh, branches, all those those good things. This brings that to your Octopus configuration. Specifically, we're talking initially about deployment processes. So being able to bring it into that, that workflow, that version controlled workflow is, is the game. Um, that's, that's the value proposition. The, the kind of side effects that flow on from that are 
I think the thing we just touched on earlier, the fact that you can now leverage branches to effectively have drafts of, of the deployment process is, is a really powerful addition. Um, and then there's, there's just, I guess, again, ignoring the version control aspect, being able to edit things in a text editor, while as we touched on early is probably a really bad experience if you want to start from scratch and write a whole deployment process. It's a pretty great experience if you want to make small changes, especially bulk small changes. You know, text editors are really well optimized for copying, find, replace, these kind of operations that are just pretty tricky to build into a UI, especially across multiple projects. So yeah, I think the the combination of of all the benefits of version control, the benefits of of using a text editor where appropriate, combined with these powerful new branching mechanisms in Octopus, and you're getting pretty close to the uh, the value proposition of of the feature. I think as well, though, it's like you've touched on it as well. It's about really where you're more comfortable with. Like for instance, I definitely would be more most comfortable in the UI. However, that doesn't mean I can't work with David, the developer, um, who's more comfortable. At, you know, right now the the code the code and the, and configuration files. Yeah, and this influenced our design a lot as well. Like we were talking about earlier, not wanting to throw away the UI to go all in on that text file. Uh, you raise a really good point. A key reason for that for us was because a, a wide range of different people use Octopus. Absolutely, development teams use it all the time, but so do uh, QA teams to deploy changes, so do release management teams. So, you know, everyone involved in shipping software often uh, use Octopus in various capacities. And one of the really powerful things that I think it brought to the table originally was was that that idea that anyone can deploy, for example, or anyone can come in and make changes, to take all of that away felt like just a really significant step backwards and uh, a trade-off that, that we didn't want to, to make. But, you know, again, as, as we've said along the way, these, these design decisions, we're really uh, happy with them and the way they've played out. But boy, did they make the feature harder to, to ship along the way because it, in, you know, instead of instead of having that vertical slice, there's a way of thinking sometimes when you build new features. This one was, I guess, a horizontal slice across the bottom. It kind of undercut everything existing, and um, yeah, it it meant uh, <laughs> it meant it was uh, definitely a, a journey to build. wasn't There was no quick wins here. We had to consider how it played with various different features in Octopus. Uh, yeah, we had to build a lot of abstractions into the into the code base to handle both. Because I guess the other thing to hint at here as well is we're not going to force uh, anyone to use config as code, certainly not initially. You'll be able to opt in for different projects. So for everywhere where we made changes to support persisting to a Git repository, we also still have to support writing, reading and writing from a database as well. So in terms of uh, engineering difficulty, we set the bar pretty high on this one uh but hopefully the results are worth it that's it i think um obviously we've, we've it's called this a journey uh and then <laughs> i think it's now becoming more of a saga this is like part one um obviously there will be uh part two three four five and six um obviously those are a little bit further away from us so on that uh, michael can you just share a little bit um on how it actually is uh, supposed to be working yeah, and you know we're going to uh, have a, a webinar in the very near future where we really dive in with the you know uh, demo and everything. We'll talk about that later. But so today we decided not to do that for this um, I guess meta webinar. But I can hand wave a little bit and talk about this because luckily the the actual surface area of the feature in terms of what faces the user isn't isn't that that big. So in Octopus, in a given project, you'll be able to go to its settings and you can point it at a Git repository. Once you do that, the, the Octopus project, initially the deployment process, but eventually variables and run books and anything else that makes sense, gets written into that Git repository onto a chosen branch. As soon as you then navigate to the deployment process editor, you'll see there's a big branch switcher at the top, very similar to what you'd see in, in GitHub, for example. And you can change branches and view and edit those deployment processes on whichever branch you like. Um, and then when you go to create a release in Octopus, you can choose which branch version of the deployment process you're creating that, that release from. 
and that's what gives you that round trip to to test those those branches in various environments and yeah all the usual octopus goodness applies alongside this um so yeah awesome awesome so obviously we've talked about um deployment process um, can you share is it just the deployment process is in, uh, contained in this version of config as code or are we doing anything else yeah, for initially it's the deployment process we tackled first, but and we'll ship this and and learn from from all of your feedback about what next. But we have some pretty strong assumptions that variables and runbooks will follow immediately on the heels of it. They just make sense as well. I mean, variables runbooks are very similar in in a sense to deployment processes and make make just as much sense to be version controlled. Variables are really powerful. The idea of them in in uh, a source code representation in in version control. In some ways, to me personally, the variables bring even more power than the deployment process itself does. They they tend to be the things that I find myself making bulk changes across. For example, um, yeah, they change per environment, et cetera, et cetera. So I th I think that will be a whole a really powerful addition, and it's we. I'm pretty sure it's coming straight after. That's nice. It's funny because variables, uh, I can see a really useful use case because what I find is I create the the variables, then I create the deployment pr process, and then, you know, it's like you've forgotten maybe a few. And I always either, you know, put a dot in. Um, as part of that, I'm a big fan of creating uh, functions. So, like, if it's a global variable, um, variable set, for instance, then it's global dot. And sometimes what I'm guilty of is forgetting where I put the dot. Um, so I've actually been able to work within a single, you know, obviously I'd imagine it'd be a, a couple of different fields, but at least that way then when you're working with the variable, you can also work with the deployment process and uh, that'll probably make things a little bit easier. Yeah, the uh, I guess the interesting challenge for us with variables is the sensitive variables. We no one wants their passwords written into source control, obviously. So uh, yes. that that in its own will um, probably make the topic of a, another webinar one day. But um, yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, interesting approaches that, that we can take that we can take there. Awesome, awesome. So we are now getting into, there's a few more questions that we're uh, getting to, um, but we are kind of getting to the business end of the webinar. Um, so we are rolling it out. Obviously I've touched on the EAP, which is early access preview. Can you take us through what the rollout looks like uh, and when people can get it in cloud, uh, get access to on-premises, et cetera? Yeah, the, uh, the million dollar question. So technically, as I mentioned earlier, Config as Code is, is right now, it's been shipped to all cloud instances. It's, it's still hidden today behind a, a feature flag. That tends to be how we roll things out these days. Um, we we have that feature flag enabled on our internal projects and we're currently testing it there over the next days week or so as soon as we've we're happy that it's um stabilized in our internal environments we'll toggle that feature flag and at that point it will be available to all octopus cloud instances for the initial part of the ap it is going to be octopus cloud only um, so if if you're self-hosted and you do want to play with it the easiest way will be to spin up uh, an octopus cloud instance if you don't already have one and you can do that very easily from octopus.com the reason we ship that to cloud instances first for that initial rollout is just because any issues that are encountered it just lets us patch them and, and roll out any fixes to them so much so much earlier um, that that quick iteration is much easier when when it's hosted by us but as soon as that initial burst of activity slows down and, and we're confident the stability is up to the next level again we'll make it available on on self-hosted instances and yeah i guess uh at that point the the final level the final part of the journey or at least the first part of the journey of this feature will be taking the eap flag off and at that point, it's very much depending on user feedback. We, we're we shipping this as an early access. This It's still definitely a discovery journey for us. We're very keen to find out. You know, like this isn't just a, I guess, hit and run feature for us. We, we genuinely think this is going to impact some of the kind of, I don't know, core paradigms, if you like, in Octopus. And so 
So we're very interested to hear how people want to hold it, what what they want to do with it that they can't, and evolve it based on on user feedback as well. So at this point, we're not a hundred percent sure the the path that that will take, but yeah. Awesome, awesome. So what I heard there was um, we are going live. I know I, what what I think it would be good to understand and for the, the the people on the today's webinar is obviously cloud looks like they're going to get it um, and it's going to be there very soon. Or yeah. if it, and if it's not, it's all you know may already be there as well. Will we do an EAP for on-premise customers, or do you think that's just going to be for cloud? No, I think that will be the EAP as well. The, I, I hope the the on-prem comes fairly quickly after cloud. As I mentioned, it's really just uh, that that initial iteration period. It just lets us do it faster. So no, I think self-hosted will get this as well. It's as an EAP. It's it's worth calling out here too. Anyone who's followed the journey of this feature is probably seen us uh, announce dates a few times and, and miss them. Certainly one of our learnings along the way was, uh, you know, when you're building a big feature like this, there were so many unknowns. To be honest, this, there still are. It was, it was a mistake of us to, uh, yeah, I guess to, to call out the, the dates that we thought we'd hit. We're certainly as bad at estimating how long things take to build as, as anyone, probably worse. Well, that's it. I think, but the thing is, is we've always been quite good about giving everyone an update. But yeah, like you say, you know, we're pretty much now on the third, uh, you know, V uh, three uh, of it. So that's cool. Um, and you know, so, but it's it is worth saying as well. We probably, if we wanted to, we could have hit those dates and shipped something. But this this was always such an important feature to us that every time we would learn something new and have one of those forks in the road of you know, do we just get this out there and and you know live with it or do we take our medicine, do it right, and learn from that that mistake? Yeah, we've we've definitely built this one for the for the long road, not the not the quick ship. I think that's a, the best way to do it, though, Michael. Um, so you're talking about feedback. Um, how should people provide feedback? Uh, is it email, user voice, etc.? Uh, yeah. So there's a in our community Slack. There's a configures code channel, which is a great place if you want to talk to us about it interactively. Also, once this feature lights up in those cloud instances, you'll see in the little orange EAP chips, those link off to feedback forms as well, which we will monitor super closely. Um, and you know, if you have any more, I guess, uh, reliability-based feedback, our support channels are always there as, as they always are to give quick turnaround on any of those issues. So yeah, I think structured feedback via that EAP form is, is brilliant. You wanna have a conversation with us, always love to in the, in the community Slack or um, issues via our, our support team awesome awesome right well unfortunately that's the end of my questions for you michael uh, obviously the future of config is in your hands and it's also in our users hands so at this point i'm going to have a look and see if there's any questions so michael uh there is actually uh there's 14 questions uh so there's quite a few um, Shane is asking on about the the estimate on when cell fit the install can uh, when can they get their hands on it? Do you have an idea roughly date wise? Uh, just to clarify the question, that was for self hosted installs. Yes, yeah, self hosted. Yes. Yeah, I I'm really reluctant to give a date here because I know it'll be wrong. Um, yeah, as we mentioned, the cloud in instances are being rolled out to right now. It just depends how long it takes us to stabilize that. I would hope we're talking weeks. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Thank you so much. Uh, so I've got a question um, from Stephen. Uh, this one's fairly long. Uh, so if you do need me to repeat it, just let me know. Uh, is there any chance that we may see branch aware version controlled custom step templates? It, um, what Stephen is asking about, it's similar to how uh, it works for Optimus projects. So, um, Stephen currently has built uh, ways around it by using the Git CLI and uh -huh. custom step template codes. Uh, and then that actually pulls the main step template from a repo. Uh, but this solution sacrifices some of the convenient and convenience in having to choose between the Octopus UI and the Git repo. Yeah, absolutely. So th this is one of the things I'm really interested to see how it plays out. So the branch that you're on will be absolutely available as a variable while that, while that deployment's running. So you'll definitely be able to take action based on which branch you're on. But 
I really love the idea as well of seeing where this goes. You know, in Octopus today, when you want to execute a script, you have the choice of either putting the content of the script directly into the UI or packaging the script up and sending it in. Often I find that's neither of those is exactly what I want. I just want to be able to reference the script from the Git repo directly where it, it lives. Um, and I'm really excited to see to see those kind of workflows playing out. But in answer to the question, yes, I definitely expect to see custom step templates that leverage which branch is currently being executed on. I hope I answered that that question correctly. I think, I think that was fantastic. Uh, Stephen, if you do want any more information, uh, reach out to us at webinars at octopus.com. The questions are flying in. I don't think, unfortunately, we're going to get to all of them, but let's get cracking. So James is asking, do you have any best practices built up yet for branching strategies when versioning uh, your project process? <laughs> um, we're going to rely on you to tell us that. No, the I guess we very much like the idea of the, the Octopus configuration sitting alongside the application code. So already in our, in our internal repos, I love the fact that we've got this kind of array of tooling folders in the repo. So we might have our you know, new build scripts or whatever it is, Team City configuration or Azure DevOps in these folders. And then there's a dot octopus folder sitting there as well. And I, I just love this. And so I guess the answer there is whatever branching strategy that you use for your application code, I would suggest the the, the workflow of being able to do a pull request and see on the pull request the application changes along with any changes to the deployment process is is really powerful. The, I guess it's worth calling out as well, the other way to hold this, which I, I, I'm not sure how common this will prove to be, I'll be very interested, is to not store it alongside application code and to store it in a separate repository designed uh, purely to hold that Octopus configuration. Nothing stops that, um, but I guess that would open up different types of branching strategies. Having, having spoke to... Uh, you know, doing some usability tests of this already with real customers, one of the workflows that people have been pretty excited to see is that is that pull request workflow where not everyone has the ability to make changes on the main branch. And this is the way that, say, a release management team can approve and restrict those changes. Anyone can make them now, submit a PR, they can inspect them and merge those in. But yeah, ultimately, um, we'll see, I guess. Awesome, awesome. Alex is asking, uh, he's, he's saying that branching is seen as a really important feature uh, as part of Config as Code, which, which is correct. Um, he's asking if we could expand on some of the common use cases and some examples that the customers have been asking for in real life projects. That has also been asked a few different ways by a few others as well. Yep. Yeah, I think this plays into some of what I just spoke about. I think the big the big scenarios of problems here are to break them down. Number one is the one we talked about during the content just then, this idea of a draft, just it, it, being able to make a draft change to the deployment process, iterate on that and you know, burn a, a bunch of changes just getting it working without affecting that main line. That, that on its own is one whole use case. Um, the other major use case, I think, is the idea that you've created a new branch of your application to develop a new feature. Let's say you're adding, I don't know, a new service to it. Um, and as part of those changes, you also need to make changes to the deployment process. Today, it's really quite hard to coordinate those. You know, if you've got a V2 of the application where the deployment process is quite different in Octopus today, people end up doing, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a, a few uh, workarounds that you can do to model that, but none of them really feel that nice. I love the idea of just being able to make those changes on the same branch that you're making the application code changes on and merge it all in together when it's ready and it all just lives um, together. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess the other one is, I guess, the permissions-based based model where it's because certain branches are restricted and so there it, it's really about that approval process of the pull request um other than that uh th there's probably a whole lot of things here that we just don't know yet either this is one of the things we're really keen to see is how people hold it awesome thank you so much michael um shane's asking uh Obviously, we did cover the variables, um, and obviously, variables will, will come in a later release. Uh, you know, that may be next year. Um, what Shane's asking is about variable sets. Uh, would variable sets be included uh, under variables? Yeah, no, pr honestly, like this is still up for grabs, but 
they make a lot of sense to be version controlled as well. They, they wouldn't be by default is the answer here. Today, the implementation we've gone with, the project is very much the, the container of the things that's version controlled. It's, it's at the project level that you can configure that. Um, so variable sets wouldn't be included in that without um, doing something else. But I really see this version control as, as kind of having a gravity to it. And it's going to want to pull everything in. Like you mentioned library variable sets there, but step templates make such sense to be version controlled as well. Um, and I, I pretty much expect that this will have some impact on the shape of, of the Octopus kind of information architecture to use a terrible term um, going forward. Um, just to, to work around that version control. But yeah, I, I suspect not initially. I think it would probably be the project variables that would be version controlled first and we'd figure out how to deal with library variable sets next. It, it, that whole level of um of what what level you version control things, that was pretty tricky, but the project was just the obvious place to start for us. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, do, uh, Peter is asking the same question, but asking for a timeline. I'm assuming at this moment uh, it's unknown. Uh, timeline for the cloud instances uh, is pretty much over the next week. Um, you'll see those light up in, in Octopus cloud instances. We'll, uh, our marketing will, will come out in that time as well and make it very clear exactly when, when it's hit every instance. So stay tuned to our blog um, and yeah, you'll see you'll see the announcement once it's it's fully rolled out to all cloud instances. We kind of have, without going into too much detail, we sort of have these rings that we roll changes out through, um, and yeah, it takes a little while to hit every instance, but it's it's rolling out through the rings as we speak. Excellent, excellent. There are a lot of questions based on timelines. Uh, I think for the most part, we are we are still working on that, um, and th th there will be. Um, with the timeline, I imagine most of this will come next year with the core functionality uh, potentially being GA this year. Uh, Michael, would that be accurate? Yeah, I think so. Like none, nothing from here on in is going to be as big a piece of work as the initial chunk was. Like putting all those, uh, you know, architectural foundations in place took a lot of work um, and the, the rest will flow from here. But the, the reason we sort of can't give concrete roadmap here is where we're, very much looking for you, um, our users, to to drive this as well. We we want to hear what's most important to you to hold to build first, and we're even expecting a few surprises along the way. You know, in in things that we ways that people want to use it that we didn't anticipate, and just to leave ourselves open to to action that in whatever order makes the the most sense. So like, please uh, give us your feedback on it once you get your hands on it and and yeah tell us exactly how you'd like to use it we're we're absolutely very interested awesome this uh this one is paul uh he's thanking us for the webinars thank you paul um he mentions um would there be any tooling available to migrate from an already set up octopus ui instance to the new octopus config as code model or, or are the two entirely different realms that will coexist side by side and if, I, and if he chooses to go for config as code model, will he have to rewrite everything again? Uh, good question. Uh, no, like this was something we worked really hard on. You'll be able to convert existing projects over to be version controlled with the click of a button. There's no migration required and it, it'll work for any project. So um, no is, is the answer to that every and... Um, yeah, no migration required, uh, should work for every project, and yeah. Excellent. Uh, unfortunately, Michael, uh, the questions are coming in faster than we can answer them. Um, so I'm going should to we just, do a speed uh, round, Derek, try and go through them quickly? I've probably yeah, been I'm waffling just, a bit. I'll speed it up. No, 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 it's not that. It's just it, there's so many questions, which is really great. Um, so will other assets like like, like life cycles, et cetera, also be version controlled? Uh, that's from DAG. <laughs> Oh, great question. I'd love to dive into this in tons of detail. Um, so yeah, life cycles make so much sense to be version controlled. And I, again, think that this will, we'll see that the architecture actually shifts so that they will be, um, they're not initially, but, uh, you know, uh, in the future, I think so. Yes. I, I think we'll combine a few of the concepts like life cycles and channels, and that will end up version controlled, being able to specify things like package version rules and things like that in the, 
in the source controlled artifact it just makes so much sense. And we've already actually been playing with an implementation of that internally um, that initially didn't quite play out how we thought, but it, yeah, it proved the, the worth of it. So yes, I think in the long term, absolutely. I think you'll, you'll see a lot of that get pulled down into projects. Awesome, awesome. Um, do we have any previews, screenshots or documentation of what it look, uh, will look like in EAP? Um, and if not, will that is that something that we can share in the future? Yeah, we really, I, um, I guess um, that wasn't part of this webinar and I, I hope we didn't mislead people with that. But um, we we're doing one, when are we doing the next one, Derek, where we'll show it in all its detail? We are back uh, two weeks today. Um, so for those who um, are disappointed, I am really sorry. Uh, this was always all about the, the hill we built. Uh, I am back uh, again with Michael on the 22nd. Uh, and what we're going to be doing is a full hands-on demo. Uh, where we're going to be taking uh, projects, configuring it from scratch and all that good stuff. So I do apologize for that. Um, but certainly if you check out octopus.com forward slash events, unfortunately, I, and we are out well. We have got so many more questions. There's 17 there. Um, if you do, if you can, please do reach out to us at webinars at octopus.com and we'll come back to you as soon as we possibly can. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, um, in our community Slack, I'll certainly hang out in there for, for a while. Um, if, if you can get into there in the Configures Code channel, happy to take any uh, follow-on questions in there too. Awesome. Uh, I'll be there as well. Uh, so, First, I just want to say thank you so much, Michael. That was really great. I'm really sorry we didn't get to more questions. I think we could have just had a, webinars of, a webinar of questions, though. Maybe we should um, do it like that next time, Derek. Just open the floor. <laughs> you know, I actually really like that idea. Um, so um, just want to share some resources. Um, if you do uh, require any assistance with Octopus, uh, if there's any sort of problems, please reach out to us at support at octopus.com. If you are, uh, you want to have a chat about your license, um, please reach out to uh, sales at octopus.com. Uh, we also have a customer solutions team. You can reach out to them at advice at octopus.com. Those are the ones that are more like, how do I do X and Octopus? Um, and just one thing, um, we do stream all of our uh, webinars to YouTube. You can see them all and you can uh, subscribe to be notified of any upcoming webinars on youtube.com forward slash octopus de deploy okay so uh what i just want to do is thank you everyone uh, who came along today uh, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you uh, on monday um like i mentioned earlier on we do have a technical deep dive with configures code on september 22nd 23rd and 27th uh, dependent on your region uh, and then i am Matthew Casperson and Sean Cessna are back on the 6th, 7th and 11th of October and they're going to be showing off uh, all our new Kubernetes uh, functionality using GCP. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and um, I'll catch you next time.